started today. Um, so my topic today is Kinetic GPT, creating an AI assistant for the Kinetic Drupal theme. I'm Michael Lander, uh, work for Elevated Third. Here's my contact information, so you're always welcome to re reach out, ask questions, give me feedback, whichever. Here's my bold statement for today. Um, hopefully I don't chase anyone away. Hopefully I, I draw you in further. Um, but ultimately, some technologies will benefit immensely from AI, while others will falter. As Drupal users and contributors, we should consider what we can do to better position Drupal in the community to benefit from AI. So I think this is just really looking at like, you know, there's work already being done with things like CK Editor and how they integrate with AI. Um, obviously, I think a lot of people use co-pilots and, and tools like that. But I think we can look further, like how do we create tooling that helps developers answer questions and, and, and really empowers them to do their job and be more efficient and, and be able to make a bigger impact. So we're gonna break this up into three separate sections. Um, first one is gonna be around introducing the idea. Next one's around really training the AI assistant. And lastly, it's gonna be results and retrospectives. Let's, we'll see how it actually works, um, kind of the key takeaways from it, and, and ultimately go from there. So first, the prologue. What is Kinetic? Um, it's worth pointing out that Kinetic is not the main character in this talk, um, but some of the key features or parts of this theme are, are important because obviously we want the assistant to be more aware of it, learn about it, um, and be able to help speak to it. So one of the big features in it is the single directory component focus. Um, for anyone not aware of what single directory components are, it's probably one of my favorite new features in Drupal core um, as of 10.1. Um, really, it's a component system built into Drupal core, so whenever you're defining elements on the page, whether it be something as small as a button or bigger components like cards, blocks, layout, anything, you can componentize it by ultimately combining a metadata file that describes the component a twig file, which is all of your markup, and then style with CSS and behavior with JavaScript in kind of a self-contained folder, which we'll get more into, but it's a big, it's a big f kind of motivating factor behind why we built this theme um, and really drives a lot of the decisions we made with the theme. In addition, um, there's automatic library chunking. All this really means is that when you use packages, like say embedding React or embedding um, Glide.js or any sort of like NPM package in it, it'll automatically generate a Drupal library for it and it'll attach it to that component. What that means is if you use that component, or sorry, that NPM package multiple times, it's still only gonna load it a single time. So if you wanted to embed React into the page into multiple blocks or something like that, you're not loading React for each one individually. It'll actually create a Drupal library for it and make sure you only load it once, which is um, a nice feature to have. Additionally, it's built around Bootstrap 5, and then it's Storybook ready out of the box. So it's taking advantage of the Storybook contributed module. It's an awesome module, highly recommend it. Um, so we have taken advantage of that so we can spin up Storybook really quickly for your theme. So the idea, why everyone's here. Um, build a custom AI assistant with specific domain knowledge around the kinetic theme. Some of the key objectives that we were trying to target with this is could we take things like design files, Figma files, mockups, anything possible and generate those components faster. Um, taking kind of some of that like redundant or kind of that monotonous work of like how many times do you really want to define a button component or some variation or version of a button component um, or maybe other kind of design UI things that this day and age, you know, it's kind of moving towards um, um, that kind of universal design system where a lot of websites are all kind of growing to be similar in a lot of ways. Um, this is the kind of a goal of like how can we expedite some of that project for the process for those things that are very similar across those sites and make that quicker. Next was a personal kinetic expert. So how can you have a personal instructor that's very knowledgeable about kinetic that can quickly explain to you maybe where your code's located, what makes this theme unique from maybe something that's in Drupal core, um, really is something that helps you maybe onboard 
faster or at least be a helpful resource in your understanding about where maybe code belongs or what makes it unique, um, where different things li live. And next was a front-end coding sidekick. Could it maybe recommend code solutions to you, give you snippets of code, um, anything that it can do to, uh, with that kinetic code base specific awareness um, to, to ultimately help you with your theming endeavors. So I'm breaking this up into four different sections for the plan. The first one we're not gonna spend uh, much time on just for sake of brevity, but it's to determine the right model. So for those kind of familiar with AI right now or unfamiliar, ultimately AI started very narrow. Um, it meant it was very good at processing sets of data and starting to draw conclusions about that. Think of like things like the Netflix, rec Netflix recommendations. That's kind of very narrow AI. Here's your, your kind of watch history. Here's things you liked, disliked. It's generally moving to a more general direction. What that means is while it's able to potentially do more things in the way it's like able to ingest imagery and read that imagery, react to it, maybe write different types of text, write different types of text with different tones, um, as it's more capable of doing a lot of different things, it's also right now at least kind of losing its ability to be very truthful or consistent or um, uh, I guess correct in its responses and stuff it's giving you. So this was kind of a challenging decision, but ultimately um, for this particular test, we, I did end up using a chat GBT, a custom chat GBT, which we'll get more into. Um, for the next was about creating the system itself. Um, this, something we'll, this is something we'll jump a lot more into detail about uh, the initial setup, how I began loading content onto it going from there. Next is adding additional data sources, um, looking at both data that we've generated, but also like code that we could load into it or other data sources that we could add to it to, to improve the model. And last was like that feedback loop to continue to refine the results we're getting, making it better, what that should look like, what kind of data we were sending back to it to ultimately improve the results we're getting. So first I just wanna establish a baseline with vanilla chat GPT to show you, you know, two example questions and what you'd expect if you were to just go throw this into chat GPT-4 and, and get a response back. So the first one was that I, uh, uploaded this image of a button, and then I asked it to essentially create a Drupal component for the attached image. And, you know, for this particular example, I did specify at least that this is Drupal, so it does have some awareness at least that far. It doesn't know anything about single directory components. It haven't ex I obviously haven't explained it or gave it loaded in any sort of context into it yet. So all it knows is what it knows from the web and just more of a, a generic Drupal theme installation. So its approach to this of ingesting this image and ultimately giving me something back was to create, create a twig template um, for the button itself. Um, and then basically it gave me some generic CSS that it was like, I'm not gonna tell you where to put this, but here's some CSS, figure out what to do with it. Um, really to be expected, uh, we haven't given it any sort of direction about how we structure things, how we set things up. So a generic kind of general Drupal response, I think is um, fair, is pretty fair response from it. The next question I left intentionally vague, um, and that's gonna be important to the testing later, but ultimately I just to told it to tell me about the dot theme file. Um, it doesn't know I'm talking about Drupal here, um, and so it's gonna come back with just a very ge generic explanation of dot theme files across software, um, Windows desktop themes, web development, it mentions WordPress and Drupal, other software applications, um, GUI frameworks. Doesn't really know anything, it's just giving me a high level explanations of what a dot theme file would be for. So let's jump into actually creating the assistant. For those unfamiliar, and I apologize that the contrast is a little bit hard to see here. But when you're configuring a custom GPT, you're kind of working across these three tabs. The first tab is the GPT builder. This is where any sort of prompts you give it are taken as feedback for it to use to improve its model overall. The next tab is a configure tab. 
this is more of just a traditional settings form where you can input things like name, description, instructions, conversation starters, which are really just like examples when you're first opening up the chat. It's like the examples at the bottom. Um, you can also do some additional configuration around plugins or actions, um, which are like additional things like, do you wanna allow Dolly image generation? Do you wanna allow the code interpreter to run? Um, all the different kind of plugins that you're essentially enabling for um, your custom GPT. And lastly, is the, the, which is the one on the right, is the preview pane. So as you're feeding information into these two on the left, you can simultaneously go into the one on the right and test it to see how that input is ultimately changing the model and changing the responses that, that you're making. So most of the time you're really spending a lot of time over here on the left inputting new things, tweaking things, trying to improve it, and you're going to the right side, asking it maybe the same questions again or asking it new questions and seeing you know, the quality of the overall response. So when you get started, it does ask you a few questions um, just to help you kind of set the overall tone for it and, and um, uh, to set some initial context for the GPT. It'll also help you generate a logo that's the best I could get to come up with. I apologize um, in advance. In addition, um, a description, some initial instructions, and then it helps prompt those conversation starters. Um, the instructions area is probably the most important part of this configuration form. It's where you can really outline guidelines and behaviors for your chat GPT. So for my particular example here, um, I'm saying that the user should be experts at Drupal theming. I don't actually feel like it should be only for experts at Drupal theming, but for anyone that's used chat GPT, it tends to be very verbose by default and it often will over explain things. And what I wanted is if it was something that you wanted to use it day to day, um, I wanted it to focus more on like the thing that you're asking and trying to get it to ultimately um, be more concise I didn't want it to spend a lot of time like re-explaining the same concepts over and over again unless the user specifically asked for more detail um, to drill down further on one of the, the pieces. Um, in addition, I also asked it to pri prioritize code snippets and examples. So um, maybe this is how I'm a learner, but again, ChatGPT being very verbose out of the box, I felt like if I'm going into a theme to wanting to, to alter the code, change the code, be able to see actual examples of the code and it not try to explain all of this away um, would probably be preferred. So I specifically tried to steer it towards leading with those examples and code snippets by default. Next, I picked an area to focus, um, and this is so that I could do kind of some initial testing and even just validate that this idea might be able to work. So. Initially, I, I focused on those single directory components. I wanted to claim the word component. So whenever you're talking to ChatGPT and you ask it to create a component or tell me about a component, I wanted it to naturally go towards single directory components since they were such a key piece of functionality to this assistant. Um, and then I explained the difference to it between a human label, human readable label and a machine name. So the machine names used kind of throughout the the directory and file naming structure, which I'll get into, and then the human label is what you're going to see if you're using debugging tools or just you know searching the metadata file. Um, so just explaining those because they're pretty fundamental in how this all is set up. And then I explain the concept of variants to it. So a variant um, is something that we're using in Kinetic. I think you'll see it in some patterns and other themes that are using SDCs. But really, like take for example a button, a definition of a button. If you wanted to break out a primary button versus a secondary button um, into separate components and put maybe specific rules or behavior or styling around those, um, it, it, for us it's just a naming convention you would use so that you can still associate them even though they could be separate buttons, or sorry, separate components altogether. So I explained that to ChatGTP, so hopefully you could use that when it's coming up with, with naming conventions overall. Next was explaining the file structure to single directory components to 
chat GPT. I'm not sure when you signed up if you realized this would also be an SDC training course, um, but here we are. So explaining the name of the folder, telling it, hey, you know, first, first place to start is the name of the folder after the machine name. The next was to describe the, the component, or sorry, the metadata file to it, which uses the con convention of the machine name plus component.yaml, and then describe all the other files to it, which includes the twig file, the CSS files, the JS files, um, all for kind of basic scaffolding purposes, and also explaining to it that there's some uniqueness or some things that we require whenever it's defining those. So for example, we use SAS, which ultimately will compile down to the CSS. Um, and so I tell it when doing SAS, here's the, um, the selector, CSS selector you should embed based on the name of the component. Same with the JavaScript piece, um, telling it like for JavaScript, I would like it to generate a behavior automatically. Here's how I'd like it to name the behavior. Um, I wanted to use a combination of the component label, but in Pascal case, um, and, and make sure that it wraps the JS code by default. So instructing it with a little bit more detail on how we expect the component structure to look. And lastly was for the directory, single directory component generation workflow. I didn't want it to start spitting out code until it asked me if it's correct. Um, if anyone's ever used ChatGPT for generating codes, you know it's fair, fairly intensive, fairly slow. Um, I didn't want it to start generating that, especially when we're using that machine name all throughout the different file names and also in code in different areas. I didn't want that to be wrong and have to wait, you know, 30 seconds every time for it to get through all that um, for me to say, actually, I wish she would have named it this instead. So I asked it to prompt me any time before it generates that component. And then I threw in a couple of best practice things just to again kind of see like if I explain best practice or at least what how we're approaching you know certain best practice things is it something that it'll listen to or be mindful of. So in our particular case, we like to use background images that are say responsive images or uh, standard images that we position with CSS instead of using inline styles, gaining a lot of the benefits of like lazy loading and um, you know, loading different images based on device, things like that. So that's one of the things I instructed it on. In addition, I told it, please don't use jQuery. And we'll, we'll see how it goes. And then from there, so there's actually a lot of testing. I don't wanna like mislead anyone. There is a lot of testing that I've been doing in here. I don't have enough time and I don't think anyone wants to sit here and watch the amount of, the amount of testing I did ultimately on this. But what I found is like it did at this point, pick up a lot of what I was saying. It also became very obsessive about single directory components. Like I couldn't get its mind off of single directory components. So it made me realize that I probably needed to start loading more information about the theme in general and maybe step back from just the single directory component piece. Is there a quick question? Yeah. Exactly that, using that preview tab a lot or saving it out and actually going to the GPT itself and ask it some questions and see what, see what it comes back with. So um, it was one of those things that I might, you know, at this point I would have added, asked it about um, the libraries file and it would somehow make it about single directory components and so that's why I was like, okay, everything I've given it so far is basically single directory components. I need to find ways to explain the rest of the theme to it. So this was the next challenge, the code base for Kinetic. How do I get that into there? Um, and so I looked at a number of things like actions and plugins and um, I do think in probably the future that will be the way to go and they're really just like custom bits of inputs that you can build on top of a GPT to like have it do more advanced things like read a repository um, maybe do like image searches, web browsing, code interpreters, things like that. I couldn't find one that let me preload though the repository that I needed as context so that when you come to this thing, you, it already has the context of the repository in mind when, it, when you're asking it questions. So I, I couldn't really find a solution going that route though I have no doubt that, that probably in the future it'll be something around that. 
So what I did find though was a Python script that ultimately took a directory and it flattened it into a single file and it used essentially breaks in the file to explain any code beyond a certain point. So it essentially inserts this kind of break and it says, all right, this flat file represents a directory with a bunch of files in it. Anytime you see this um, kind of line break sequence, um, treat this as a separate file. I explained to it that anytime someone asked it questions, I needed it to, to treat this file as a representative of a folder structure, not to just point people at this file. So if I wanted to ask it about, you know, again, going back to libraries.yaml, I didn't want to point me at this flat file. I wanted to treat it as if it was a file inside the system and that it had an understanding of that directory system. So I explained it and, and hoped that it would work. So again, we'll get more into the examples, but um, I also told it how to treat readme files. I also told it whenever you ask it about a specific file that if that file exists inside of Kinetic, tell me about that one first. So if I were to ask it about that libraries.yaml, default to explain the version that's in Kinetic, not to the version that's in, um, you know, maybe a higher level kind of Drupal theme or something in core or so forth. Tell me about the ones that, the, the one that is specific to my theme. I had also decided at this point that probably the more examples I could give it of components, I'm back to components if you can't tell, but um, the more examples I could give it of components, the better. So we actually started exporting every component we've ever built and flattened that as well and threw that into here as hopefully additional training data to come up with better quality recommendations. And then I also wanted to explain the schema file um, or, or ingest the schema file. It was having a hard time parsing JSON in particular, so I did the same thing with this. I ultimately just turned it into a text file and the first line is gonna explain to it that it should treat it as a JSON file to hopefully improve again the quality of code generation that I'm getting out of it. So let's test this again with those original two tests. The first one is again that creating a Drupal component for the attached image. One thing it did correctly is it actually prompted me before continuing. So it said we wanna name it button with the machine name button. Is that work? Do you wanna continue? I told it yes. And these are the, the, on the left is the original version, on the right is the new version. Um, it did correctly outline essentially that the folder structure and file structure that I asked it to do. So a button.component.yaml, button.twig, button.scss, button.es6.js, which again are the one, our format for essentially compiling down those with our Webpack setup to CSS and to JS. Um, so yeah, it did all that correctly, which was awesome, it was a success. And looking a little bit closer at those code examples, you can see um, with that button.component.yaml, it, it correctly identified props for text. So what's the button text display as well as the URL um, that's expecting. I'm not necessarily sure if I would use a string for everything here, but um, it's still decent. Um, an earlier version of this test was also including a lot of extra component properties, some that aren't even necessarily used by SDCs right now, even though they're part of the spec that's being defined. It was lacking things like that schema that appears at the top. Um, and so with the additional examples we gave it, it started to like focus more on the fields that we've included elsewhere and the setup we used elsewhere. So it did seem to be learning from it and ultimately improving its results. Below is that button.twig, kind of same thing. I was impressed that it was able to pick up the for attributes using the add class method and attaching the classes that way. Some of the earlier results I was getting was more just throwing in a, a class attribute and just kind of standard, standard HTML markup for those. So that was pretty cool to see that start to work. In addition for the button CSS, it was able to wrap it with 
the rules I had around the data component ID selector, including using the machine name in there correctly. Um, as for the CSS, I think you'll notice a trend. It's really inconsistent and it's not something I would probably ever use. In this particular case, it's not using anything from Bootstrap. I didn't spend a lot of time training it on anything from Bootstrap yet, so I didn't really expect it to, to do too much there, but it is technically aware it, it exists and that we did load that directory in, but it's something that definitely needs more training. For the JavaScript, again, it successfully generated the behavior, it named the behavior correctly. What it had inserted was uh, something that anytime you click it, it's gonna alert you. Um, I don't know if even JavaScript's necessarily useful for a button, um, and at least kind of your standard run-of-the-mill button you might use on a site. But I never told it not to create it, so I you know, can't fault it for that. Um, so yeah, an alert button, um, pretty, pretty decent job. For that ne the next test, I was going back to one of tell me about the dot .theme file. Um, so in this case, it does correctly explain the dot .theme file. Um, what's unique to Kinetic is we don't generally put a lot of um, functions or hooks inside of the kinetic.theme. We actually break them out to be a little bit more granular. We just found that sometimes that dot .theme file could become pretty big or unwieldy. So we break that out into an includes directory, and then we have a block theme, uh, or sorry, a block.theme, field.theme, form.theme, node.theme, et cetera, and we just kind of break it out into categories to make it a little bit easier to find and, and keep sane. Um, what's interesting about this is it only got through four of them when it was explaining those different files and then it kind of gave up. So we have like 10 of them or so and it was like, okay, I'm done, like at four, I'll just stop there. So um, the fact that it was able to pick up on that um, and, and actually tell us about that folder structure means that you know some level of that code ingestion is working and improving it and it was able to read it, which was pretty awesome. I just, I'll touch on it more later, but the fact that it kind of fizzled out after just telling me about part of it um, is problematic and kind of a recurring trend. The next piece to this was the actual model feedback. So really diving more into like the, the questions, responses, and going back and improving things. So I kept throwing more at it. So anytime components are talked, or sorry, in this case, it's the components directory at the top level. So when you use SDCs, it's expecting a components directory that's at the top level of your theme or your module, similar um, to how you would see like an SRC directory in a module and so forth. It's just a pattern that it's defined, same with templates, directories, things like that. So for SDCs, it expects there to be a components directory. In our case, we actually have it nested deeper because it's part of kind of a design system structure. So um, I just tell it that there's a sim link, so it's aware that those are one and the same. I did tell it to stop recommending to put code in connect.theme. Um, it really wanted to put code in connect.theme, and, and so I had to constantly kind of remind it that it shouldn't do that, so additional training on that piece. I explained to it though some things around how to do font preloading. I recommended local fonts over remote fonts and possible. Um, and I also told it to not preload fonts unless they're actually used in the theme because sometimes it would start like trying to include random fonts that we weren't even using. Explain to it if you found a component on Bootstrap 5, what's the process of actually bringing that into the theme and, use, and taking advantage of that. I explained to it how you can use the font preloader that's built in the Connect so that um, you gain a lot of the advantages of preloading your fonts with performance and what that might look like for different fonts, whether they be local or ones that are coming from things like Typekit or Google. Again, with the kinetic.theme, I had to keep reminding it, tried to kind of tell it different ways. It did eventually seem to get it, which we'll talk more about, but um, some once isn't always enough. Uh, maybe it's a little too human-like in this regards where you have to like keep training and you're like, no, no, no. I have a 21 month old, so I feel like now I had two children that I was trying to teach the same things to, so. Um, I also told it, you know, I just kept honestly loading more things into it. We won't spend too much time, but this is something that I just ultimately 
continue to do over and over um, is refine existing things, teach it new things, try to improve its understanding of the theme as a whole. So let's look at additional examples. So this first one I asked it to explain the directory structure inside of that source components directory. Um, this is your how you categorize your components. So for example, if you use atomic design, this might be your atomic design directories for atoms and molecules and things like that. We use a little bit different directory structure in Kinetic. It's very similar to atomic design. We just have a different naming convention. Um, and it correctly was able to break those out and explain them. It actually was able to read the readme file and use the information from that to help input um, ultimately that description that it's generating for it. So we successfully picked that up. On the left here, you can see what the actual structure is from, from Kinetic. I then wanted to drill down one step further and asked about which folders are inside one of those specific categories. So in this particular case, I wanted to tell me about all the files that are inside of the elements directory. It was able to correctly tell that those were the components themselves. So above it kind of knew that it was categories, below it could tell that within that, those categories were the actual components. And it started breaking them out for me. So a dialogue component, button component, trigger component, image component, video component, form component, link button component. It broke those out, explained them, but it also left out a few randomly. So it left out the link component, but explained the link button component. Um, rich text it left out, table it left out. Still really impressive, but I think the, the part where it kind of drops things and maybe doesn't tell you that it's dropping them is, is something, again, that was kind of a recurring theme that made me nervous. And let's see some other questions. So um, I asked it what bootstrap variables for font colors. I was trying to get a sense of like, does it really know that Bootstrap's in there at all? Can it tell me anything about it? It was able to come back and tell me some of them. And uh, to be honest with you, there's probably more than this, but it was still nice to see that it had some awareness and was able to pick these out and talk about them. I asked it where you should put preprocess for HTML. Again, going back to that, that idea of how we do our .theme file, it was able to successfully tell me the best place for that would be inside of the include slash html.theme, which was correct. Asked it the same exact question for fields, but with theme suggestions instead of preprocess. And same thing, it was correctly able to tell me that it should go inside of that include slash field.theme. I drilled down a little bit further and I, t I said, tell me about the contents of field.theme file. And it actually did in this case, tell me about the exact code. It didn't, I was a little nervous that it might misrepresent the code or change the code or output it differently before spitting it out to the screen. It did actually spit out the exact code and it um, described the code to me. So I thought that was pretty cool. The next test was the step up from the button test. Um, so I actually took the banner, uh, one of the banners from the, the DrupalCon website and threw that into there and wanted to see what it had come up with. In this particular case, I wanted it to also use a card subcomponent, which is something we hadn't yet tested. Um, so it did, direct, it did correctly generate two separate components, which is awesome. Um, and then it did correctly nest essentially one component inside of the other component. It did kind of randomly miss out on this over here. It just like pretended it didn't exist or maybe it thought of it as a card, which is a little unfortunate. Um, and so that part was a miss, but I do think the fact that it was able to generate two separate components and embed them and loop through them and stuff was pretty impressive. This is something that was kind of a recurring theme is that the results varied a lot. Sometimes it gave us really like impressive res responses and maybe it would catch all the properties and slots and everything inside of the component. Other times it seemed like it just maybe honed in on just a few parts of it and got those decent and everything else it kind of ignored. And then I followed that up by asking it to give me a zip file of all that code, which it did successfully. Um, this is something that Two months ago when I tried, it was really hit or miss. 
Um, but it was pretty cool that you were able to ask it. Like, I don't, you know, I don't want to go in and copy all this code. I want to probably could have typed it out by then. Can you just give me a zip file so I can copy it in? And it worked. We'll see if it stays working, but it worked. So that was pretty cool. And then it actually took that. And so the next time I asked it for a component, it just decided to give me the zip file automatically. So I didn't need to ask. So that was pretty cool. So for kind of one final test, what I did is I actually added um, or uploaded an image of the Drupal.org website um, and asked it to create components for the entire screenshot. And from there, um, it definitely took a little bit, but it um, correctly started to process this image and break it down into individual components. It did focus just on the top level so it wasn't really doing any like nesting components or you know if it defined something like a button using that button in multiple places but it was able to read it and kind of give some decent component examples um, but ultimately it did the prompt and what i wanted to do is i wanted to exclude the top navigation bar and i wanted to exclude the footer i was like the likelihood of those have already been done pretty high let's just do what's unique on this page and I wanted to kind of test its ability to let you refine without it blowing everything up and starting over. So I asked it to leave out the top, top navigation bar and leave out the footer. And it came back with a, uh, the correct kind of response. It said, here's the components without the top navigation bar and without the footer, and asked me if I wanted to continue. So I thought that was pretty cool to see it actually let you refine on something and let, instead of it being something where it's like, OK, let me just start over each time you you ask it to improve, so asked it to continue. And then what it did actually is it, it added an additional step that I never trained it on or asked it to do, but I think because code generation is more intensive, it kind of planned the whole thing out, saying, all right, here's all the files we're gonna generate. Do you want me to continue? And so it introduced that step on its own, which I found to be interesting. Um, but yeah, ultimately, Everything looked good, so I told it to continue. And I'm going to speed this up. Oh, we lost it. So then it actually starts to go in and generate all the code for the individual components. One thing you might notice is that it gets pretty lazy. So it's no longer really doing properties inside the component.yaml, doesn't do slots. The component.yamls were very minimal. The markup was actually more impressive. It was um, none, none of it usable, but there was generating like a decent amount of markup. It was trying to do rows and columns. Um, it was trying to like loop through and, and print things out. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. It recognized where images should print out. It tried to do like H3s, H2s, paragraph tags. Um, the CSS was, was, I didn't try it, but I, I know it's probably a disaster just from past experience. Um, but it was able to go through and what it did is it would do two at a time. And then it was like, I'm tired basically, should I continue? And I'm like, yes, like we're gonna finish this. So um, it was a real slog, but we got through it. So yeah, continuing to uh, grind through and ultimately get it to generate all the components. I did ask it to give me a zip and it crapped out halfway through, so uh, I think it met its limit, but it was still, again, pretty interesting to see like if we pushed it further, what it was able to do with it um, and go from there. So let's talk about some of the results and just the retrospective as a whole. Um, ultimately, what worked, what didn't work, what are those key takeaways? First, we'll talk about the good. On good days, some of the code was kind of sortable, usable to start with. Like if I was just gonna maybe scaffold with it and delete the, the guts of it, it maybe would save some time. Um, some of the answers of the, uh, to the questions were, were more than adequate responses. I thought this was one of its strengths was when you asked it about 
a, a certain directory or you asked it about a specific file, you asked it to explain those things and look at the code, it gave pretty good responses and I thought by far this was its biggest strength so far. Um, I thought that the idea that it could ingest an image and to output actual code and kind of identify what's going on in that image was really impressive. Like that was cool. Was it usable again? Probably not, but it, it is still extremely impressive and it was even able to, to do that full web page. Like to me, that was, that was pretty crazy to see, um, especially in something like an LLM, which, you know, we won't go too far into that, but not something I would have necessarily expected an LLM and its ability to like switch into a different model like that, read it and then spit out something completely different um, was awesome. And then while using the G GPT, I was able to refine um, towards a desired outcome. So being able to say, leave this out or include this or you know, kind of narrow down the response to what I was wanting and it to do that without necessarily losing track of where it was, again, was really impressive. And it, it's definitely doing a lot better than maybe when I first tested this a number of months ago. The bad. Realistically, again, most of the code was not usable. There was some, some areas where it came in good enough and it would be somewhere that I would have no issue copying and pasting and then going through all of it and probably fixing it, but it, like it, just to have it scaffold out some pieces, um, you know, maybe it was usable, but for the most part it wasn't there. Some, answered was, some answers were really amazing and then it would just stop. Like, it, like I showed you a few times, it was like explain this directory and it's like, here's half of the directory and I'll explain that half really well, but I'm just gonna leave the other half out. So that was a pretty common theme. It definitely has good days and bad days. So some days it was, um, it seemed like it nailed a lot of the questions a lot better and then the next day it was just non-existent, wasn't really giving me much there. Um, so yeah, I would say overall it's trended up. I know there's all these theories about how it's getting worse and it's potentially getting worse. I didn't see that. I felt like generally it did probably improve over time. Um, but, but I, it's still, yeah, it can still be day by day or even question by question that the, the results may vary. And to be honest, it's that last one's a little bit the setup of the test, but I think it would provide significantly more value if it had contextual awareness of, like a, say a implementation of the theme on a project. So, once you've taken Kinetic and you've built all these components, you know, 100 components into it and customized it and changed things, to me, that's where maybe the real value would be. And probably one of the faults of this test is like the scope of just a single theme might not be the correct scope unless you were to add that element of like, this has been implemented and customized and made unique in different ways. I think then it would probably be much more impactful to have an assistant that can help you identify and find, you know, what makes it unique or point you around folders that are much more complex or have a lot of uh, overrides or customizations. Yep, question? They're slightly different, but like for instance, if, you, if someone had like a executed storybook component library. Yep. And like the whole thing is there, it's like, we're gonna extend this. But if you were to train it on not only like, hey, this is a storybook, but these are the actual components. Yeah. I do. Yeah, more examples definitely help. Um, and then even better are if you're asking questions about a code base and it's got all of that context to the specific code base you're working on beyond just like this default, you know, version of, of Kinetic, it's only going to be that much better when you're asking it questions and, and that much more useful. But yes, with the storybook one, I think if you fed it a lot of storybook examples, it's gonna definitely help the quality of response or give it the ability to even generate storybook files, which is something I was trying to fit in before this was actually getting it to generate the storybook files for the components as well. Um, and then what I call the ugly or ugly. Um, it has no real understanding of priority. So if I were to give it a set of components that I said, these are the best versions, use these. Um, and then I gave it another set and I said, here's some good versions, maybe use it to reference, but these aren't the gospel. It just doesn't 
from what I can tell, have any sort of ability to, to negotiate between those right now, um, which again, it's hard to say. LLMs were not really supposed to get as far as they did. It seemed like a lot of people felt and they keep growing in their capability. So it's something that it might continue to improve on, get better at. It's just so far, it's not something I saw a lot of evidence that it was able to do. To stop using jQuery, um, interestingly, none of the ones I did for this presentation were giving me jQuery, but in, I definitely, even pretty recently, were get, was getting responses that would include jQuery, no matter how much I told it not to. Um, it's very difficult to understand what is being uh, retained, what may be lost over time, and what is no longer relevant. So I think being developers, we're very like logical. We're like, all right, if this, do this. With this constraint, don't let this happen. You know, that's how we think. With AI, you're like just throwing all this stuff into here and you're like, all right, did you learn anything? Like, what did you learn? And then it suddenly forgets that. And so I think that's really hard is like, and on top of that with token limits, what they are, which are growing and, and there's evidence that they could grow rather quickly even with the newer models. Um, you don't know what's getting pushed out. And so you could be feeding it additional context and technically it could be kind of forgetting certain things you told it. So how do you manage that? Like how do you manage what's still relevant and important? And I think of like if we expanded this to have a Drupal wide GPT, how do I tell it not to give me recommendations for Drupal 7 approaches to do something unless I asked explicitly for a Drupal 7 example? Or even more recent, what if from Drupal 10 to Drupal 11, some service name changes or whatever, hopefully it could pick those things up, but I don't know how you can necessarily trust that it's doing that, or maybe when it's looking at issue queues or whatever, how it's able to prioritize and whose perspective does it use? Does it use my perspective about what's important and what's not? Does it, like, that's, I think that's kind of that dynamic where it's really difficult to see a path of like how this will progress or improve. Um, the next one is being confidently incorrect is dangerous and AI is great at being confidently incorrect. So it likes to state things no matter how truthful or incorrect they are, it says them the same. And it's like, if you wanna do this, do it this way. It's never like, I'm not sure, maybe you should do this and so, if you know, I'm asking it questions that I know the results of because I'm like looking for expected result. If you're handing this to someone who you know, hopefully this is meant for, who's trying to learn more about your theme, and it's telling them both incorrect things and correct things at the same time, that's really dangerous. And lastly, looks like a duck, acts like a duck, but it's really just good at looking like a duck and acting like a duck. Um, and I do think, you know, this overlaps a lot with the last one, but it's again, giving somebody access to this and using it, and it's very human-like in its responses, but its logic doesn't work the same as human logic. I think it's just a d dangerous precedent because how you treat it, how truthful, like how your ability to trust it to do something, all of that kind of factors into how it's acting human-like in nature. And so I just think, it's kind of at the point where like, it's kind of like self-driving cars where it's like when they work, it's great, but when they don't, it could be really disastrous. And I, I see the same for this. It's like, there's some cool things it's doing, but it gets a lot wrong, but it doesn't really tell you that it's getting it wrong. So last thing is just a slide to say, look, like I think obviously there's a, AI is not going away. Like no matter how you feel about it, like, I, like we're gonna have to think about how, what that means for Drupal and Drupal builders. I would encourage people to look for opportunities to empower Drupal developers and Drupal builders. Like how do we make these, this a kind of a weapon we can use to be that much more effective as developers and builders? And maybe these are areas it could help with. As you're writing code, perhaps it's writing tests or ex fix, fixing accessibility issues. Um, maybe it could interact with like Drupal services or actions like generating content types or um, generating views. Um, the new kind of recipe stuff, it could help on that side. Performance optimization or just like recommending models. You know, as stated earlier, there's over 50,000 projects out there. It's becoming a lot harder to find relevant modules and 
end projects to your thing and ones that are maybe updated, could there be a, a piece to that where it could help in these areas? Um, so I think these are all just uh, more areas that we could be looking at AI solutions to help us connect the dots. Issues is again, one other area that I think it could help big time is like, there are so many issues at drupal.org and there's a lot of overlap, but sometimes it's not obvious. Maybe one's fixing something more upstream and one's fixing things more downstream. It might be able to help connect some of those dots and be like, hey, these are actually one and the same, just fixing it different ways or different kind of areas or approaches. So I think maybe correlating issues that might not be as obvious to someone unless you're spending kind of a lot of time digging in and, and diving into it further. Lastly, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw a link to it on the, the project page. Unfortunately, because it's built on GPT-4, you have to have like the advanced account or whatever for chat GPT to be able to try it. But you're welcome to go on there and I'll try to get it up right after this session and mess around with it, break it. Just don't send me hate mail. Um, any questions? Sure, go ahead. Um, that's a good question. It was kind of one of those things I did here and there over months. So I don't know, I'd say maybe like 40 hours total. Um, but it wasn't necessarily something I was doing all at once. It was kind of like I'd put some time into it and then would leave it for a while and then come back to and try to fine tune it. I did also find myself blowing it all away for a while at first because it would, especially on 3.5, I think it was, it would get caught up on certain things that I could not seem to like remove from its memory. And so that was really problematic, but that's something that's like, over time seemed to have gotten better and I haven't had to necessarily do that again in a while. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I agree. Yeah, and when I, I looked at a number of things like Langchain and uh, Llama, and I looked at a lot, and I, I have zero doubts there's probably better ones. At the time when I started it, I just wanted to kind of be able to go very broad. But again, kind of the more broad or general you go, it feels like the reliability and the truthfulness of the model kind of goes out the window. So that was the trade-off for that, and I, it wasn't, I wasn't expecting to ever productize this or push it super far. It was more like, let's see what this gives us and kind of a test. I agree though, I think there's probably better models that will fit, especially specific use cases. I could see maybe we do a component generator that maybe works with command line or something like that. Like there's already command line component generators, but what if we added an AI specific one and used a model better fit for that? and made it a specialist at component generation. And then when you're using it, you're just specifying like, hey, I use um, Bootstrap and I also use such and such and you could give it that specification and make it work for you. But then we train it to work across any theme or something. So agree completely. Yep. Thank you, yeah, that's valuable feedback, thank you.
Yeah. Um, no, and I think it'd probably be worth testing. Um, I didn't make it far enough into that to, to test enough to say, like, aside from, like, here's some components, I did try telling it, like, use these components first, like, as examples. These ones are just reference, so more human-like explanation. I never tried, like, explicitly saying, like, score this in, the, like, an order of importance or priority. So I think it might be worth exploring. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yep. I think that's a great idea. Is establishing some kind of a priority weighting system and attach them in numerical um, context to those, I think is awesome. Yeah, you mentioned too, like, what's, what's like my priority versus what's like the procedure thing. And so there's even a problem with like getting that much into like, like, you know, prioritization profile or whatever it's like. So like, for instance, for things like that, like it's like procedure then you need to be like that. So like setting this as something that is like the data yeah. One, one of the things that got me thinking a lot about is I could see I need an AI to be able to come with like kind of prepackaged context that matters to you in any sort of AI. So like to be able to start using the AI and prepackage that here's what I care about. Maybe it's like brand compliance guidelines around when ge generating components, here's how much flexibility I want or here's the parts I care about most and be able to come with that in a way that could be quickly ingested. And, and so I think that's kind of similar. It's like, um, how do you write an AI that's both general and helpful, but also <laughs> knows enough about you and what you specifically want to do to be like actually helpful and not just broad. So yeah, I think though the, the scoring system, for example, is definitely worth trying. Great. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.